Hi, my name is Greg Remke. I direct programs at Economic Thinking. And this is a brief introduction to the transportation uh, debate topic that's being proposed for the STOA uh, speech and debate community for next year. Transportation infrastructure is the current year's uh, national high school debate topic. So I've been giving workshops on this topic over the last, uh, through the, through the uh, fall. So transportation infrastructure, the key to progress, civilization, and prosperity. I have a study guide on this topic at uh, economicthinking.org forward slash transportation. The resolution was resolved the United States federal government should substantially increase its transportation infrastructure investment in the United States. And basically, this, my study guide is simply reformatted a uh, message to debaters by Randy O'Toole uh, that was uh, uh, commissioned, I think, by NCPA in their Debate Central website. And I basically put that in an eight-page study guide and then added some uh, other articles about other books on transportation uh, reform. So that eight-page study guide, uh, Randy O'Toole is a Cato Institute scholar and interesting background, thoughtful speaker on environmental issues, urban development, transportation issues. His fairly recent book, Gridlock, Why We're Stuck in Traffic and What to Do About It, is highly recommended. His earlier book, Best Laid Plans, looks at how government planning uh, makes things worse, sort of in an odd way. Uh, but both in the Forest Service, where he did, Randy O'Toole did his original research, and then later in transportation, he argues it's the planning process uh, implemented at the federal level and local levels that made things much worse for the Forest Service and for state and federal departments of transportation. More books. Uh, Rick, Rick Geddes, Richard Geddes, has a book called The Road to Renewal. And this is focusing on ways that, that private companies can invest in U.S. transportation infrastructure to provide uh, better roads, better management of roads. Rick is a former high school uh, debater and worked with me at the uh, uh, Institute for Humane Studies years ago when he was a, a college student. Uh, Street Smart is a book from the Independent Institute, a collection of essays edited by Gabriel Roth, who's a leading uh, transportation scholar. Uh, subtitled Competition, Entrepreneurship, and the Future of Roads. So this is looking at a whole range of innovative entrepreneurial proposals to improve uh, transportation in the United States. Also, uh, Ted Balaker and Sam, Sam Staley have a book, The Road More Traveled, that focuses on congestion. Uh, Ted is based in Los Angeles, and the problem of increased congestion across the country is uh, unnecessary, uh, destructive, and will only get worse if uh, we ever escape the current uh, ongoing recession. So if you have time to read five books on the topic uh, while you're deciding if you like it, those would be the five I'd recommend. Now, here's a few minutes of basic economics, sort of the economic perspective on this topic and uh, that applies to many public policy topics. First is the economic reality of scarcity. We live in a world of limited material resources. There are only so many uh, goods, materials uh, in the world, and the demand for them is virtually limitless, which is not to say we're greedy, but uh, there's not enough goods and services for everybody who might like them, and this applies to roads. So basic reality about transportation infrastructure, that is highways, ports, railroads, airports is that it's scarce, right? We don't have uh, as many airports as we might like to have. Airports get crowded. Uh, land for airports and for roads and for railroads is scarce. Uh, so that land has to be pulled out of other uses for new highways or new railroads. The money to build it is scarce. It has to come from somewhere else. So this idea of scarcity means we have to make choices about how to deploy the limited resources we have in the country, both within the transportation field, that is the decision of whether to spend more on railroads or high-speed rail or roads or bicycle paths or airports. If we have scarce funds within the transportation budgets of state and federal governments, private companies, but also there's other things that that money could be used for. And if you use it for roads and transportation, it's not available for somewhere else. Economists can call this opportunity cost, that is the opportunities foregone when we draw more um, uh, labor and capital and, and construction equipment in to build roads. Uh, that's 
uh, resources not available elsewhere. So the cost for new highways and railroad airport, it's not just the money cost, but it's the opportunities foregone where that money could have been spent. Also, uh, when the government's involved building a new highway or new railroad, the challenge here is that uh, government gets its money through taxes or through borrowing or through inflation. And each of these modes of getting money requires uh, force or the threat of force. That is taxes, people have to pay or they go to jail or they're threatened with jail. A borrowing means future taxpayers have to pay for those services. Uh, so and inflation is a, sort of a, a tax through devaluing the value of the currency. So each of these ways of getting money you have the compounded problem. Not only is it resources could have been spent someplace else, but also the money is taken forcefully so we don't know what the opportunity cost is, right? That the, the person might prefer not to pay it. We have all sorts of economic problems caused by taxes and people trying to avoid taxes. So you're, you're disrupting the economy in many ways when you're trying to draw new money to build new highways. New highways may be needed, but to get it through taxes or borrowing may cause more damage now and in the future than the benefit of the new highway or airport or railroad. Now in the private sector, if a private company is building a new highway or investing in a new highway or railway or airport, that money still has an opportunity cost. It could have been deployed somewhere else in the economy or in the world. But at least in that case, it's voluntary. The, the, the investors, the company, the corporation, they choose to invest in this. So they've decided voluntarily that this is a better use for their money than something else. So you don't have the same kind of coercive uh, um, action or threat involved that you do with taxes. So it's an advantage of private investment rather than government. A among other advantages, that's one. Now, another important thing to look at Often when people look at more money for more roads or the federal government's looking for funding shovel-ready projects, well, it says, well, we need a new highway. This, the city or the county says, we need a new highway because this will help us. But also they say, and we'll create 1,000 jobs or 10,000 jobs or 500 jobs. So they're presenting the creation of new jobs as a benefit. Now, it tends to be a benefit for the people who get the jobs. That's true. But jobs in and of themselves aren't a, a, an end goal, right? I mean, you could hire everybody in the country to dig holes and fill them in again. They'd all have jobs. You could pay them all. And that would boost spending and make people better off, I guess. But the whole equation involves where the money comes to pay those people. It involves first what the people would otherwise be doing if they weren't digging holes and filling them up. But also the money to pay them has to be taxed or borrowed or gotten from inflation, and that has negative consequences. So the value of a highway, a new highway, is not the jobs created. In fact, that's a cost, right? You have to, you have to pull those people from other occupations or uh, um, you have to pull the money from other places. The benefit is the value of the highway once it's built, of the consumers using it. It's true that people like jobs, jobs are good things, but jobs are only good for the economy when the thing that they create is good for the economy. As an example, we had a massive overbuilding in the housing industry in 2005, 2006, and lots of causes for this, but all those people had jobs building houses and building the material that went into houses. To say that that's a good thing for those people is to misunderstand because it's a bad thing overall because that money uh, came from someplace in mortgages that went bad and investments that went bad and the too many houses shouldn't have been built. So we'd been better off without those jobs for building the extra houses in 2005, 2006. And so you, you don't want people to just go out and do anything with a job. You want jobs that, that are something that's of demand. Another way of another aspect of uh, highway construction, airport construction is that highways uh, generate noise, generate pollution from cars on the road. These pollutants and noise pollution are costs that are imposed on others. These are called externalities or negative externalities. These are bads. 
So you could argue that someone says, well, building new roads is a good thing. Well, you should count the noise that comes from it, the pollution that comes from it. These things could be um, handled with uh, better noise abatement technology or with compensating the people who suffer from the noise. But just important to remember that the benefits of new transportation infrastructure have on the other side of the equation some costs that uh, should be internalized. That is to say, the people who produce the noise should compensate those who suffer from it. And we don't tend not to have that in the status quo. So another aspect of highway and railway spending, you know, huge benefits. If you lower your transportation costs, if trucks aren't stuck in, in traffic, you reduce the cost of food, materials, you make U.S. companies more competitive because they can get the goods and materials they need at lower cost and faster. So huge benefits to the economy for better managed highways and, and more highways if needed. Uh, in addition to lowering transportation costs, highway spending can improve safety, right? Divided highways can save hundreds and hundreds of lives each year. So it costs a lot of money to expand the road and divide it so cars go in each direction or separated, but fewer people die in collisions. That's a huge benefit. Even federal or state funding to paint, put more paint on the highways. Uh, the line in the middle of the, of the regular road, the, the clearer and brighter those lines are, the more lives saved. So there's a lot of way to save lives with just uh, smart application of paint and other technologies that reduce collisions and other damage on the highways. Now, a core economic theme that applies everywhere in the economy should apply also in transportation, but often doesn't because of the confused way people talk about transportation infrastructure. You could argue that uh, bananas should be paid for by the people who consume bananas. So that the, all the money that goes into banana plantations in Costa Rica or Brazil, the money to irrigate or to harvest, to, 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 to ship the bananas, to put the bananas in the grocery store, that's a big expense. I don't know how many tens of millions of dollars to spend on the bananas, but all that cost should be paid for by the people who consume the bananas. The banana transportation costs, the boats that ship the bananas, the trucks that ship the bananas, uh, banana transportation should be paid for by people who consume bananas. Why should people who don't eat bananas pay for bananas? Okay, that may sound ridiculous, but that's just because banana is a funny word. Uh, the point is people who use it should pay for it. So highways, people who use highways ought to be the people who pay for highways, along with this sort of basic economic way of thinking. The people who use the airports to fly around, they should pay for the airports. The airport near me, SeaTac Airport, uh, people around here are taxed. They pay taxes to the Port of Seattle to subsidize the airport. Why is that? We have the noise from the airport. Why should we pay extra for the airport? Why doesn't the, if the airport were run by a private company, they would pay taxes, property taxes, sales taxes, other taxes that would go to pay for the community services uh, in this region. Why subsidize airports? We don't subsidize grocery stores. We don't subsidize uh, movie theaters. Why subsidize airports? So the overall sort of right thinking goal, I would argue, on transportation infrastructure is for the people who benefit from it, who use it to pay for it. So the railroads, when they're privately owned and run, they're paid for by the people who ship uh, goods on the rails or ride on them. Now, with Amtrak, that's not the case. Amtrak is a government railroad. It's subsidized to the tune of tens, hundreds of millions of dollars by taxpayers. And it benefits mostly people who, who take the train from uh, Washington, D.C. to New York to Boston uh, and those few other areas in, in the country where we have sort of a, a less than ideal uh, rail service. Railroads are great. Lots of people like to ride railroads, but the current way the railroads are managed, uh, at least on the uh, 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 people side, uh, people riding in, in, in air, railroads, they don't work very well. They're not very efficient. They're expensive and so forth. And they're subsidized by taxpayers. It's, you know, the government probably shouldn't be in the railroad business, one could argue. High-speed rail similarly has huge costs. 
that's okay as long as the people who use the rail pay for the costs. Economists like it when, yeah, the users pay the full costs of the goods and services they use, and this user pay system appeals to our sense of justice as well as it creates healthy incentives. You, it's key to build the roads in the right places. For example, the Inter-America uh, Development Bank in the 1970s and 80s was providing millions of dollars to subsidize highways in Latin America. In Brazil, for example, a huge amount of U.S. and international money came to build roads in Brazil. But the government got this money. The government chose to build roads between the state capitals or the provincial capitals in Brazil. So you've got these roads connecting capitals, but even you know, Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, the two biggest cities in the country, didn't have a, a very good road uh, at this time. So, and plus the funding from North America to build roads, built roads into the Amazon jungle that helped promote deforestation. So you could argue roads should be paid for by the users. Uh, that gives an incentive to build a road where it's likely to be used. This was a point that uh, Randy O'Toole makes in his book that we used to have a system where the gas tax paid for the road. When you buy a gallon of gas, some of that money is tax. That tax goes to the state, some of it, and to the federal government, and used to be rebated back to um, the state so that if the state built a new highway, if it built it in the wrong place, not many people would drive on it. It wouldn't get much gas tax to pay for the bonds to build it. However, if they built it in the right place, attract a lot of traffic, then the money from the gas tax from people driving on it over the next 20, 30, 40 years would not only pay for its construction, but pay for its maintenance. So we had a system, it was a government road system with state and federal highways, but it was a system that operated very much like it would if it was a private system. That is the, the private owner could uh, pay for his road with a toll, but also could pay with a gas tax in the sense that people who drive on it, um, the more people who drive on it, the more tax they pay through the gas tax. This is, by the way, is a big problem in the status quo because cars get better mileage now, so gas tax isn't providing enough money to pay for the maintenance of the roads. But road builders have an incentive to build roads or light or high-speed rail or railroads or airports or bike trails where people want to use them as long as those people pay for them. So we have a transportation knowledge problem. That is, we don't know where the road should be built. We don't know whether we should have uh, expanded highway capacity between, let's say, Seattle and Portland, Oregon, or expanded railroad capacity, or maybe more airports and more airplanes or maybe a, a, a boat system where you could go by boat from one to the other. We could build canals. There's all sorts of stuff you could do to get people from Portland to Seattle and back. But it's hard to know which is the best way. There's limited resources, and those dollars we're going to put into improving transportation technology, where should it go? Which, which way is best to get from place A to B? Um, if in a consumer-driven uh, system, consumer choices drive this production. That is, business people look at what they expect in the future. They invest in those infrastructures they think will pay. If consumers or road users pay for roads, the roads are going to be built where they're willing to pay, or at least where the road builders expect them. So road builders discover what roads or bike trails are wanted uh, through, through hiring consultants, through surveys, through looking at congestion. And this question of um, how do we pay how do we pay for the roads is important. This is Wimpy with his hamburger. Uh, right now, we the United States needs, in a sense, dramatic billions and billions of dollars of new transportation infrastructure investment because our roads, bridges, some are crumbling, some are massively congested, um, and we want to spend that money now to improve the infrastructure. We have to choose how to do it, and we have to um, borrow money to do that. That is, money has to come from investors that are paid back in the future. Uh, Wimpy's uh, word on hamburgers, he says, I'd, I'd grad gladly pay for a hamburger today, tomorrow. The question is, do you trust the guy to give him money for a hamburger today? Do you trust him to get your money back tomorrow? If 
California, for example, spends $20 billion building high-speed rail, they're going to have to borrow that money to build it. If they build the rail in the, in the place and in a way that not enough people ride on it, or are unwilling to pay the price and tickets, then this massive amount of spending can't be paid for by users, which means whoever b loans the money to California is going to be stuck. You'll be like the guy who loaned Wimpy uh, money for a hamburger and didn't get paid back. So we have competition prices in the discovery process. You know, we don't know the best way to make a hamburger. We have uh, the economist William Easterly in his uh, uh, great book, uh, his great great book called called uh, uh, who, who, whose great book whose title will come to me momentarily. Uh, it talks about the planners versus the searchers. One of the core benefits of a market economy that Easterly says we have in America, Western Europe, Japan, is the economy is full of searchers, full of entrepreneurs trying to figure out what people want and trying to figure out how to inexpensively put together quality services that people are willing to pay for. So searchers in the highway industry are trying to find uh, what transportation infrastructure people are going to want to use uh, next year, next decade, and they are want to pour capital into those areas. They're searching for services, transportation services to provide. The planners, on the other hand, who people who say, well, let's have a, a giant high-speed rail or let's have a, um, a light rail. Uh, these are sort of um, state or federal or university people who think they know what's best for people and they're trying to get tax money or outside money to use it. Now obviously every uh, business requires people that are in the planning process but Easterly uses the, um, this is his book called The White Man's Burden, he says in Africa you've got tons of planners, aid workers, UN workers, others that have plans for restructuring societies there and building stuff but instead of bottom-up sort of searches, searchers and entrepreneurs and enterprises solving social problems, you have top-down people from the outside. So this is very much the way you would be critical of top-down Department of it, uh, Transportation planners who are planning what uh, national uh, high-speed links the country should have or a new canal system or new railroad system. Uh, so planners versus searchers is a model to look at uh, the way the economy works and sort of what's wrong with the transportation policy. The market system, users pay, entrepreneurs search for solutions, and they're trying to figure out how to, how to find the right things. They're trying to innovate to create new solutions. So let's look at the question, what's the best way to get people from home to work and back or from Seattle to uh, Portland and back? Uh, we've got transportation congestion, congestion now. Some $200 billion are wasted annually in just freight transportation. That is, trucks stuck on the highway. The one on the right is in China, uh, where trucks are stuck on the highway on the way to ports because the Chinese government and private sector hasn't built enough infrastructure. Next to it is the U.S. Uh, highway somewhere where, again, massive uh, congestion. This is money lost every day. $70 billion in wasted fuel every year. What's the best solution? How do you reduce congestion? These are you know, people standing in lines like they did in the Soviet Union trying to get underpriced uh, goods at the stores. Well, we've got planners and searchers in ways to solve this. Uh, so let's use this as an example. Looking at the cost of traffic jams, congestion, one interesting way to think is you can, you can pay for new highways simply by making them work better. Uh, one study, uh, Texas Transportation Institute in 2011, 4.8 billion hours on the road and 1.9 billion gallons of gas just because of congestion. That is because the highways aren't wide enough where they're needed or for some other reason we haven't coordinated the use of the highways such that uh, people are jammed up trying to get to work and back. Now, if you are from Seattle or Los Angeles or New York or any other city with a lot of congestion, you just may take it for granted that the highways get jammed up in rush hour. But economists see this as a market failure, as an unnecessary market failure. And we compare it to other uh, aspects of the economy that, that don't have congestion the way we have traffic jams. 
Since 1982, the U.S. population's uh, grown some 80 million people, so we've got more people. So not surprising there's more people on the roads. 1980, we had 122 million cars on roads and highways. 2008, 256 million cars. So double the number of cars, um, 80 million more people. It's not surprising there's more congestion, more cars on the highway. Now, you could say, well, that's how you solve the problem. You get rid of 124 million cars. Well, that's one way to reduce traffic congestion, but it's no accident that we have 256 million cars. That's because people want cars, they're willing to pay for cars, and when they buy the cars, they pay for the cost of production of the cars. What they don't pay for is the cost of production of the highways. Uh, because we have a mixed up system that doesn't allow them to pay that directly. So what we would argue is how do you have highway construction and innovation keep pace with the increase in highway customers? More people want to drive in Los Angeles or Seattle or San Francisco. How do we, how does the economic system provide the highway capacity to serve the people who want to use it? As an example of this, in the in the movie industry, people like to go out and watch movies. So you might say, well, how do we solve the problem of providing enough seats in movie theaters in the right places so that when people want to go to movies, they can go out and see a movie? We've had an increase in the population, so somebody has to make sure there's enough movie theaters to provide movies for all the people that want them. Movies are a reasonably good example because like highways, highways most of the time are underutilized, right? In the middle of the night at four in the morning, there aren't nearly as many people on the highway as the highway could handle. Instead, you've got peak demand at rush hour in the morning, rush hour in the afternoon, um, uh, weekend driving or Saturday, Friday driving people uh, going on vacation, those jam up the highways, but also most people want to go to movie theaters at Friday uh, or Saturday and at a certain time. So how do the movie theaters handle the fact that peak usage, peak demand comes at certain times and at other times there's very limited demand for the space that they've set aside for people to watch movies? And the answer to that, of course, is they use prices to different prices at different times. And we'll come back to that. So here's a discussion of transportation innovation. Uh, it may not look like it, but this is an image of a way to deliver messages that was popular in Chicago. Chicago connected all its downtown buildings with a pneumatic tube so that people could send messages throughout the city, not by getting in their car and driving a message or sending it Federal Express or putting it in the mail and having trucks deliver it, but to send it through vacuum tubes where the air would, would power the messages around the city. You see this in banks sometimes when you go to a bank. So what's the best way to get people uh, from home to work? Well, maybe you could send them in pneumatic tubes in little uh, compartments. Uh, or maybe you send people to work with electrons. That is, you use Zoom.us Zoom or Skype for video conferencing. Maybe expanding video conferencing is an alternative to getting... In other words, we say, well, gosh, we've got rush hour, it's jammed. How do we solve that? Well, maybe building enough infrastructure to solve everybody who wants to drive to work and back is not um, the answer. Maybe the answer is through... Uh, technology that allows people to work from home or near home in in ways that allows them to communicate with the office. So here's the Chicago pneumatic tube system that uh, uh, worked for shipping goods and services, goods and uh, uh, letters and so forth around Chicago. Uh, in Germany, they're building a, a, a Zeppelin-based system. Uh, uh, more than 70 years after the Hindenburg disaster. Uh, the idea is to, you can carry, you know, trucks carry heavy freight and railroads carry much heavier freight, but Zeppelins have the ability to carry very heavy freight in a way that doesn't require highways. So maybe in, instead of spending a billion dollars to expand our highways, maybe a fleet of Zeppelins would be a better way to deliver heavy cargo from place to place. Or by the way, um, the railroads are shipping massive amounts of oil 
now uh, because pipelines are are held up in regulatory uh, limbo, but pipelines are alternatives to railroads. So a pipeline can deliver liquid oil or can deliver coal slurry, or a pneumatic pipeline could deliver you know goods across the country in vacuum with much less energy than uh, the status quo. So we really don't know what alternatives there are in transportation without looking at entrepreneurship and having an open market for investment. Uh, we used to have pneumatic tubes transport for people. So here's some, here's some historical, the, the, the London tube, we still have, it's called the tube. It's the, uh, the tunnels that, that send people around London. Um, other alternatives for that in the Futurama and elsewhere. And there's companies that propose that now. Intellitube is a company that wants to send people and little modules around uh, the city. The idea is it's a much less expensive way to go from place to place. Uh, this particular person seems to have taken his clothes off to travel, but uh, as far as I can tell, uh, that's unnecessary. Uh, in any case, the Intellitube system, you have a computer that reads the information and people are zipped around in these tubes. Uh, this very high transportation system, VHST, is, has you basically have vacuum, uh, uh, vacuum uh, tubes, uh, one going from coast to coast in the U.S., 21 minutes to go from New York to California. Um, you have to handle the acceleration so you're not flattened like a pancake, but the idea is that acceleration at one hand requires a lot of energy, but the braking of it at the other side is accelerating uh, the return trip. So is this a reasonable alternative to railroads and airports? Who knows? Uh, let companies decide. If they want to invest in it, uh, terrific. Here's a proposal from the futurist saying, we, why use trucks and cars to deliver stuff? 90% of the energy for shipping goods is you know, starting and stopping the car or the truck. Why not just send the goods? So here's food tubes is a set of underground tubes de designed to deliver uh, food from the grocery store uh, to home. A little video shows how it's done. These uh, rapid pipeline capital ca capsules could be built in a city. Uh, it has a construction cost, but compared to what? Compared to the gasoline and highway costs. Um, the advocate of this says that these sort of pipes technology, now that we have computer technology to do it, would allow for food to be sent from place to place. They appear to want a food co-op to do it. Uh, it's not clear why, but that's, again, this is one entrepreneur who says uh, this is a better way to do it, uh, environmentally good, less diesel fuel, and they have, and, and the weather doesn't uh, mess things up, so in the northeast where it snows, maybe this is a better system. So, again, this is a promotional uh, video from um, this organization. You can find this and many others uh, online. Uh, another way to save money, why not uh, order from Taco Copter? You order your taco and they send this uh, uh, drone-like copter out and it comes right to your location and delivers you a taco. On the East Coast, they have lobster copter, copter and the idea is you can order a lobster. You order it with your smartphone. Uh, the system GPS tracks where you are and this copter comes and delivers it. Again, there's less highway congestion and it's delivered to your door. Uh, not clear that they're going to easily get uh, permission from local government officials to fly these things around, but uh, interesting technology. Now, uh, next part of the presentation is going to go back to cities trade in the ancient world and look at transportation through civilization, and I'm going to stop and handle that in the next part. So thank you very much.